Welcome to another edition of the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I'm your host, Peter. Tonight is part one of a two-part foray into my relationship with the Anderl brothers of Dayton, Ohio. Tim Anderl is my publicist as well as being one of my very good friends. Tonight we broach a multitude of topics. We make our way across many Pratt Falls and uh, anecdotes about being involved in the respective scenes that we've been involved in, about the relationships we still have with the people embedded in these scenes, about fatherhood, about parents, about parenthood, about marriage, about life at large. This is a less an interview and more an interplay between two good friends just having a really great time talking to one another. I'd like to thank Rattlesnake Venom Trip for this phenomenal song playing behind us. Vicious Cycles. And without further ado, I give to you Tim Andrew on the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. So what what are you up to this evening, sir? Well, before I hopped on this call, I watched uh, Zombies 3 on Disney Plus or whatever the Disney streaming network is called. Mm-hmm. And I I will have to say I um don't need to see that again. <laughs> 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 It's what we do for our kids, right? Yeah. Pretty much? Yeah, Oliver's seen it, I don't know, probably half a dozen times now. Uh, Enough to know all the words to the songs and stuff. (laughs) Is Oliver sleeping right now? No. um, No. (laughs) He's, he's, uh, well, so he's always been one to want to co-sleep. Yeah. And so I told him once, once first grade starts in a couple weeks, he's going to be sleeping in his, in his own room. But I've been kind of, uh, a little bit lax about, um, you know, forcing the issue of getting him in his own bed and stuff. So he's in there tonight watching alone, um, on discovery plus that's something <laughs> that we've discovered. We like to watch together. Um, <laughs> being miserable and freezing by themselves <laughs> on the tundra. Um, so he's a little irritated. I'm doing this and not watching uh, alone with him. But right now, uh, how much? Like, I'm gonna tell you, my son's three, Canaan, and he co sleeps a lot more than he should as well. But. I have a 21 year old daughter who co-slept uh, basically almost into like fifth grade. She would, I would put her in her own room. Like I, I would get her on weekends, holidays, the like, because her mom and I did not stay together, obviously, yeah. but she would, I'd put her in bed and Elise would make her way back to my room, no matter what my, domestic situation was with a girlfriend or whatever and get in get in between us and jump (laughs) up on me and that was the end of that so as much as much as i would try to disabuse both my daughter and my son of of co-sleeping there's a part of it that i i I relish (laughs) yeah having having the this 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 being that you brought into the world and that you love more than life itself want to be with you 24 7 you don't want that to end right yeah well i just wish he he um had a better understanding of space so Mm. i have a king-size bed i'm not a small dude um and i get like the tiniest sliver of the bed while he's sleeping perpendicular to me (laughs) 
and his feet are down the back of my boxers, like warming themselves on my buns, you know? And I'm just oh. like, dude, get off me. <laughs> I've 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 made myself as small and in, in have occupied as little space as I possibly can. Just like don't touch me. <laughs> you can be here, just don't touch me. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, that's not a thing for him. So no, nor either of my children. And you know, being six feet tall, two hundred pounds, which I, you know, COVID was not kind to my physique. No, um, me either. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm the oldest of six children. Uh, the son of two parents who were overly affectionate. So it, it, when my son's all on me and on top of me and, and wanting to be near me, I'm about it. Like, yeah, come on. But just like you said, I occupy in, in a queen size bed, a space that is legitimately <laughs> like this. Yes. <laughs> Whereas my wife and son who my wife is like, like exactly five feet tall maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet. Sure. And then my 40 pound, three foot, two inch, three-year-old son, they, they have the, the lion's share of the sleeping yeah. situation. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if Oliver had his way, the 70 pound hound dog would be in there with us too. <laughs> so uh, that, that's not a bridge I'm willing to cross. Well, especially, so I, I lost a um, temporary crown last week while I was dealing with COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm like, well, I can't address this now. So I'll wait until I test negative and then I'll call the, the dentist and see about getting it put back in. So I called on Monday and said, hey, you know, I've got the temporary crown. Um, can I get in to get it put back on? And they said, yeah, we'll see you on Wednesday. So <laughs> on Tuesday, I'm making eggs and the tooth is on the counter so that I have it when I go to my, my appointment and the dog keeps jumping up on the counter and I'm like, get down dog. And so I make my eggs. I sit down and I eat them. And later on in the evening, I go to look for the tooth and the tooth is gone. Of course. So the dog has totally eaten the tooth, which is just nasty, too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a comedy of errors here, for sure. But I, I also like to make fun of it. Uh, I'll, I'll back. You're back. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I do like to tease him uh, in the morning. Sometimes I'll, I'll get next to him and I'll say, here we are in the natural habitat of the baby bed hog. <laughs> <laughs> the baby bed hog has no known predators. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like for as long as we've been, you know, discussing life and, and, you know, coalescing with one another, we like you and I have legitimately never looked at one another. Um, <laughs> And you know the way my podcast works. You know my first question. You yes, know I where know. I'm. You know what I'm coming at, right? You know where I'm. Where oh, I'm coming. And, and and you probably, I would suspect you probably know what my answer is. I probably do, but the people who listen to this podcast do not. So sure, sure. Let, let, let's pretend I don't. <laughs> okay, so I so I know the the question, mm -hmm. and the question is, what is your most existential fear? Yeah. And my most existential fear, honestly, um, and in particular, given, you know, what we've been talking about is being a shitty dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like, I don't want to do things. Uh, you know, be, being a parent doesn't come with a manual. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I've got some advantages because I'm an older parent. Um, mm -hmm. So at 45 with a six-year-old, you know, it, it's a different set of challenges than I think somebody younger would deal with. And I think 
primarily those challenges are, um, you know, kind of being set in your ways. And, um, you know, when, when my ex was pregnant with Oliver, one of the things that uh, a friend told me was kids will ruin your life in the best way possible. Yeah. And I think for an old dad, like that, (laughs) that sort of advice has resonated with me is like, yeah, I mean, it turns your world upside down for sure. Um, But that said, like he was somebody that I always wanted to to be in the world. um, And I always desired to be his dad. Um, So now that I'm his dad, I don't want to do anything that's going to particularly cause him harm or you know, do things that he's going to have to reflect on later and be like, you know, that was kind of a shitty thing for my dad to, to do. Yeah. Um, so that's my big fear is what he will tell his therapist <laughs> late in life that I did to ruin it. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, I've always ascribed or subscribed to the notion that just so long as I'm not who my dad was, I'm golden. And I, I, I love and miss my father fucking dearly. I love my dad, but he was crazy. Vietnam vet ears yeah. around his neck, Vietnam vet. <laughs> but, um, in the same token, I, had uh, I'd inherited so many great things like my, my insane love of music and, and, you know, my social consciousness comes from that very same man who was very afflicted by, having to go over to a foreign country and kill people that he didn't necessarily have anything against. So well, at an age where, you know, they say that people don't really stop their brains don't stop growing until they're like 25. Mm -hmm. And you think about these kids who are 18, like in these traumatics, I mean, their bodies in trauma, their minds are in trauma and then by you know you know if by the grace of god they survive that situation mm. then they have to come home and like reconcile it all yeah and it's nuts it's, it is it's absolutely nuts it, it it lends credence to you know kurtz in apocalypse now like the horror the horror yeah apparently yes it, it's horror but in the same token you know, you come back from something like that and then you put six kids into the world and yeah. you expect them to be well adjusted and it's not going to happen, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but thankfully, I think uh, our generation, because you and I are like less than a year apart, our generation has the wherewithal and and the hindsight to kind of put our own spin on our own damage. Yeah. You know, well, but, but we have a lot of garbage coming into our, uh, <laughs> into our little bubbles each day that, you know, people of that generation didn't have to deal with. So there are good things to it. You know, people have sort of normalized therapy and, um, depression and PTSD are, are much better understood than, than they were. But then too, like, you know, when you're in this bubble surrounded by, you know, even, even probably just a moderately liked person probably has a thousand friends on social, all the social media platforms who are always chiming in about stuff. Mm. Um, And, and so it's hard not to, see what they have to say and then have to reconcile that against who you believe you are and who you believe you are within your family unit, within your community, you know, those kind of things. And I worry too for um, my son to become, you know, an adolescent or a teenager um, and be, you know sort of 
connected to his peers constantly Mm -hmm. because that's not something that you and I dealt with. You know, we, we could leave high school at high school or, or junior high at junior high or whatever. And we could come home and like, you know, even if our, you know, even if a family was fucked up or something like that, like you got at least a reprieve from bullies or, 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 you know, people at school and stuff. And, um, so one of the stories that's going on, uh, you know, that I've been hearing about in the news is this mother who's talking about how Instagram, it, her, so her belief is that her daughter's exposure to Instagram caused, um, or, or, or was causational with regards to her suicide. Mm-hmm. And I really feel for that mother because because to, I believe it. To deal, deal with adolescence and then not be able to disconnect from the, you know, that insular world of being a teenager yeah. has to be, it has to be torturous. Well, th- and think about it too. Like <laughs> the world you and I came from when we were in junior high and high school, um, the, the fact that a subculture even existed in the very small Midwestern towns that you and I inhabited as children, uh, that was escapism at its core. And well, and that was a, the reprieve. I yeah, think. it was the reprieve. Absolutely. You know, there, there wasn't a hot topic when you and I were in high school. It was not cool to be a skater, to be a punk rocker, those kind of things. Like you were a freak. And you were treated as such. And the fact that you kind of had this small um, subculture um, of like-minded folks was, was, uh, you know, sort of a way to distance yourself from not being the normalized, uh, you, you know, sort of version of who, the people at your high school thought you should be if you were going to be cool or, right. you know, going to be accepted. You know, you could go to a punk show in somebody's basement or, you know, for me, it was um, Brookwood Park Hall um, that was north of town. And um, so kids from a lot of the surrounding suburbs um, going out there to see bands play and stuff. Um and, and sort of feel like, you know, I'm not the jock. I'm not the, the you know, preppy um, kid. I'm not on student council, but here's kind of my niche. Yeah. And um, it, it, it made it a lot easier to, to sort of weather <laughs> the rest of... <laughs> the week if you'd seen you know three awesome bands on a friday or saturday and and bearing that in mind like i I'm, I'm sure kids like this still feel like this i'm sure of it but that that sense of alienation and that sense of uh not having uh, a, a way to let the pressure the head pressure off uh that would only legitimately be fulfilled by either for myself and i'm sure for you going to a show or like i was fortunate enough to have found a band to have played in at the age of 13 um you know playing these like burgeoning vfw hall and arcade hardcore shows you know like everything else it built all week and it it fed that mechanism of, of, of angst and and torture and and complete and utter like hatred for the outside world to the point where maybe kids like, you know, um, the, the kids from Columbine or any other of these mass shooters or whatnot, they're not shown, you know, here's another way to kind of let, let that pressure off to express yourself, to be seen, to have exposition, to have, uh, a a, a, a voice, uh, uh, something screaming into the void that says, here I am. I have no mouth and I need to scream uh, instead of having the impetus to 
destroy the lives of the people that you despise instead have a, a creative and and a fruitful way to put that forth right it, it actually kind of makes me sad that the the way i what i'd had that secret that little kernel of uh of, of you know just beauty in life that that jubilation of of having an escape i get to go and do this this is mine i'm a part of something else i'm, I'm not cool but i'm cool here i'm not i'm not anything in the eyes of my peers until i'm here and when i'm here i i all is well in the universe these kids that go out and do these terrible things are they terrible kids or is it just a terrible world that they're trying to weather and they're sensitive i find myself very torn i've been in arguments with people in bars like that like that young gentleman uh, about 10 years ago who uh i guess one of the batman films had come out and he dyed his hair like the joker oh and right snapped and shot up a theater uh if maybe he'd had something akin to a hardcore scene to express himself within the confines of would he have chosen to pull a trigger or would he have just started a band? Right. Well, and, you know, yeah. I mean, those are interesting conversations to have because you have to wonder like how much of it is like true nihilism and how much of it is like a mental health sort of issue and then how much in, in especially the conversation has changed since 2016 like how much of it is just like domestic terrorism at this point right yeah <laughs> like yeah. like a lot of the the active shooters and stuff now like i mean how much of it is that they're crazy or maladjusted or misunderstood and how much of it is like they're they've become you know a, a terrorist yeah um it, it, who's empowered by the rhetoric of you know what's going on in the country politically you know yeah i mean yeah. i heart i hearken back to my own youth and my own you know access to weaponry I've, I've like the son of an army ranger, Vietnam veteran. I had not only access to uh, a respectable cachet of weaponry, but I also had a very, uh, very in-depth working knowledge of all of said weaponry. Uh, my father took me with him everywhere and I definitely knew how to operate a firearm. Uh, I never, ever, ever had the inclination to go out and take one of these weapons that I had, f I had full reign of and go and hurt people with it because I had not only respect for said firearm and I had respect for human life, even though I was very disaffected, depressed, whatnot, but I had that outlet, you know what I mean? And, th yeah. and these, these are the questions that just come up for me because I, I, it's not that when I see kids like this, I, I don't fully see myself in them, but I kind of also do. I grew up, I, from age 16, I did grow up in the system. I did kind of make a mistake, if you want to call it a mistake, and get put away for a violent crime, but it was a Nazi skinhead that I attacked. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? But... <laughs> 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 but you know, you, you know, I, mean, I didn't go up. And go... <laughs> it's not like I shot up a classroom. I beat up a bonehead. Right. I mean, right. sometimes it's it's worth it. But you know, I I do I see these kids, the, these disaffected, these these uh, violent quote unquote children, growing up in a world that's that's lorded over in a very George Orwellian Big Brother all eyes are on you uh living on social media type of atmosphere and it's not that i i'm not gonna say i don't blame them but i get it yeah yeah i mean that's part of it you know and 
I mean, so my dad was a veteran. I work yeah. in um, as, as a contractor for the military. Um, that's mm-hmm. my day job. And um, so coming from that punk background and then having worked as a military contractor for over 20 years has been really interesting because, um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll run across people who really, but you know, the root of their patriotism is that there's good guys and bad guys. Mm. Right. And it's less black and white to me. Um, so if you think about, people who are in villages in Afghanistan, you know, um, who are uh, catalyzed by their uh, community's interpretation of their religious text. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, how much of a bad guy are they really? You know, they they don't have access to they they don't have access to the internet. They don't, you know, they don't have libraries. They don't have people, you know, freely speaking about alternative uh, um, I, ideas. These are people who were uh, uh, born into a village, um, are surrounded by people who they're either related to or, you know, hundreds of years of... Uh, um, you know, these families have been in these villages for hundreds of years and they've adopted an interpretation of their religious text. And without access to any. Yeah. Bad guys. Like I I have a hard time saying they're bad guys. They're not. They're they're, 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 they, they are just doing what their community has, has, indoctrinated them to do i mean and and to to oversimplify it in the terms of uh you know what mass media would call it products of their environments and you know that that's people use that as a crutch when it comes to anything from inner city crime to domestic terrorism but in all honesty it's the truth when it comes down to nature versus nurture, nature always wins, sure. But when you're surrounded by something, and it is most likely in those cases uh, uh, an all-pervading disposition of hatred toward cultures unlike your own, you're going to easily and, and, and naturally adopt that idea. Right. Well, and I think one of the things that our parents did right was to give us the time and space to have I to to explore the ideologies that we wanted to explore. Right. You know, I'm sure. I mean, to today, it's not my mom or dad's favorite thing that I'm a 45 year old Peter Pan punk rocker. Right. You know. But my dad was also the one driving me downtown in 1991 to go see Susie and the Banshees, you know, with a a van full of my friends. Yeah. You know, um, and, um, you know, having written about music, you know, for decades now. Yeah. um, I can say with some certainty that the only person that follows me as a fan of my writing is probably my mother. I mean, (laughs) she's she's read more of my writing than anybody else. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, so my mom is really funny and I don't know if I've ever told you this story. So, um, I went to school in Athens, Ohio, which is Mm -hmm. in Southeast Ohio. Um, I went to Ohio university and studied magazine journalism there. Um, as a, my under undergraduate studies pursuit and one of the kids that i met or one of the men that i met while i was there was scott hedrick who ended up playing in skeleton witch yeah so um one of the things that i always teased my nice um 
Lutheran uh, <laughs> uh, mother about was, Mom, I'm interviewing your favorite band, Skeleton Witch. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, just kind of, I don't, I, it was a, it was kind of an asshole thing to say, um, you know, <laughs> to, to be like, okay, you're the only person that reads my stuff, but I'm going to affront you by m- making you sort of semi horrified that what I'm using my education for is to interview skeleton, witch. yeah. Right. But so, um, my mom being the person that she is, decided that she was going to follow skeleton witch on social media and when i would call her on the phone she would she would you know to to have our weekly exchange exchange of pleasantries or news or whatever she'd say did you know skeleton witch is playing lake tahoe tonight (laughs) (laughs) And, and so 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 at this point i've got a mind like Marlene Andrew has has taken her game to the next level. Like, what am I going to do to take my game to the next level? Yeah. So, I tell Scott Hedrick that my mom is Skeleton Witch's biggest fan, and she would <laughs> really appreciate a shout out on Facebook. Right. <laughs> so, Skeleton Witch is shouting out my mom on Facebook. So shout out to Marlene Andrew, our biggest fan. Right. So, so my mom, not to be outdone, this gets better. So my mom, not to be outdone. So I'm at my parents for Thanksgiving and I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting my coat on and I look over at the table that's in their entryway with like all our family photos. Um, so my grandparents, my brother and his family, my family, my sister, you know, and I look over there, and there's a framed photo of Skeleton Witch <laughs> in with our family photos on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, so at this point, I've just conceded that Marlene Andrew has won, right? Yeah, yeah. She's, she's won the competition at this point. So um, there was a short time where my brother had moved back in with my folks, and he went to church with them one Sunday and he called me after church and he said, Tim, I have some bad news. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, mom thinks that she's going to have to unfollow Skeleton Witch. And I said, well, why? And he said, because that the Facebook alg- algorithm also wants her to like Bongzilla and Cannabis Corpse. Oh, my. <laughs> so that was the needle that broke. <laughs> The, the camel's back with regards to my mom, <laughs> the skeleton witch fandom. <laughs> I mean, uh, Jesus, I wish I wish I wish it was that cool with my. <laughs> I, I I mean, I can't even make some of this stuff up. That I, I I've been really blessed to have two really incredible and hilarious parents. Um, so. And a, and a really hilarious brother, I have to say as well. I mean, yeah. So <laughs> your, your, your brother's a pisser. That's that's oh, just that, let's get mean, that out that, of the way. That, that's a whole nother thing. So <laughs> I, I, you know, before teleworking became sort of the the norm as a result of COVID, mm-hmm. I was working in a building downtown, and the woman who was the office manager at the building that, um the organization I worked for was subleasing had worked with my brother at his previous job. So I said, Oh, so you were there the day that Joe got the entire building evacuated for putting dry ice in the men's urinals. (laughs) And she said, yes, I was there for that. I was there also the day that he took down all of the sexual harassment um, training flyers and photoshopped his boss's face into them. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was one that I didn't know about. So, oh but I had God. worked with Joe. So when we were in high school, we worked at a movie theater together, and uh, um, he he <laughs> working with Joe brought me a lot of joy. 
um, mm-hmm. because he was never just content to uh, do his job. He always had to make it really interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I so I'm sure that you guys had like showcase cinemas or whatever there in in yeah. Pennsylvania. So we would have these usher shifts where you know uh, the Lion King would be letting out on one side of the building. And then on the other side of the building, you've got um, Congo or something letting out, you know, some other blockbuster, right? So you had these walkie talkies that you could keep in touch with the other ushers so that, um, you know, whoever finished their theater first could could um, talk to the, the folks cleaning the other theater and, and find out if they needed help or, or if they were done or whatever. And one of my brother's favorite, very favorite things to do was to put the walkie-talkie inside of the box um, that held the trash can outside of the theater. And and when the movie would let out, people would be putting their popcorn, you know, discarding their popcorn and their pops in there. And, and he would be on the other walkie-talkie saying, help me, I'm in here. And people would be like <laughs> looking into the trash cans like, Oh my God! Is somebody in this tra- you know in this trash box? And uh, so that was typical of his kind of mischief. And um, so I've I've adopted that practice too a little bit. So um, two weeks ago, I was at uh, an event for work and met a new government um, customer at that event for the first time. And um, so the event was just long hours and it was tedious. And so I got to talking to her and I decided to try and convince her that I was born with a vestigial tail (laughs) that, (laughs) that I could wiggle when I laughed. I was like, yeah, I was born with it. It was weird. Like my parents said, if they made me laugh, it would wiggle and I said, so when I got a little bit older, I had a surgery and had my vestigial tail removed. I said, but I still have a scar from it. And I have a tattoo over the scar that says, not my time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I got back to um, to Dayton, I had to call my uh, my boss and be like, hey, if um, the new girl um, files a complaint, this is the nature of <laughs> <laughs> what I did. <laughs> and she's a hundred percent justified um to file a complaint, but I just wanted to head it off at the pass. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is um neither my brother or I have been fired for any of our hijinks. <laughs> um he's been with the same company for over 20 years. Uh, who knows how <laughs> that has happened. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I've, I've, uh, had basically two jobs, um, with the military. I've, I've worked for a year in the nonprofit world, um, before becoming a contractor, but have basically had that job all of my adult life. So what, what I, uh, kind of wanted to ask you about though, is, uh, the way Sweet Cheetah kind of, uh, came to pass because, you know, you, you have government contract work, very lucrative. But on the other end, you've been involved in music journalism forever at this point. Like, did did you not do a, a fanzine at some point in the past? Yeah, so I've, I've done a couple fanzines. Um, the first one that I did, it was, it was kind of an online magazine. It was called... Uh, but don't search that URL now. I think um, mm-hmm. somebody in China owns that URL and you'll probably get a virus if you do. But um, <laughs> so for about a decade, I ran this online um, music magazine basically. And at the time that there weren't a lot of similar things. So like Buddyhead was was a thing um and 
maybe Pitchfork was around at that time. I can't really recall. Um, I know Alternative Press started standing up their website when I was an intern there in college. So I'm I'm sure they had a website at the time, but how dynamic or or usable it was, I I can't really remember. Um, so that was really sort of my well, like I knew I was going to have to pay the bills and be insured somehow, right? So <laughs> that 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 was one thing Marlene Andrew was really good at. Like the day after I got home from from having graduated from college um she i'm sure she busted into my the room where i was staying at 6 a.m in the morning with a stack of newspapers like get up find yourself friggin' job <laughs> um, <laughs> so um so yeah i mean paying my bills was a priority being insured was a priority those were things that that my folks had instilled as as being important um, but I also knew I wanted to write about music, too. Um, and being in Dayton, Ohio, um, rather than New York or Nashville or Chicago or someplace, like, if I was going to have an opportunity to write about the stuff that I was interested in, I was kind of going to have to do it myself, I felt like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had this nice online music magazine that I did for a lot of years. Um, and that was really how I got started. Um, and just the regular pursuit of interviewing bands and, and, and trying to put that content tent out into the world. Now, like, like I had mentioned before, like I wrote for the, college newspaper and interviewed some bands for that and did some record reviews and stuff. Um, I interned at Alternative Press Magazine, which was an amazing opportunity. Um, and I learned a lot actually from uh, 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 Jason Pettigrew, who's from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I know Jason. One, one of my favorite people ever. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the things that I saw um, Jason Pettig Pettigrew do were just so um, hilarious. So <laughs> he's from I remember, Pennsylvania. I, I I remember at one point the staff decided that they were going to have to have kind of a um, intervention with Jason because <laughs> he was spending like hours a day, like writing these scathing like multi-page letters to like. 15 year old subscribers that like wrote him a letter to complain about something he <laughs> not reviewed favorably. <laughs> and, um, but if, if I mean, if you've read Jason Pettigrew's stuff, like if you <clears throat> getting a six page letter from Jason Pettigrew, just obliterating your entire life at age 15, <laughs> like Great ego destruction. I, you know, there's probably a support group for people who <laughs> receive this. <laughs> like, Jason, Jason, Jason was really kind to me. And um, so here's another thing I remember. So, what, you know, back then, um, physical, you know, when a uh, publicist said, um, a pitch it wasn't even necessarily via email it was via um a package with the uh you know a, a promotional uh package so mm -hmm. it came with a press release and a cd or tape um and a headshot or you know some kind of promo picture and uh, so one of the things I spent doing that summer, um, well, aside from like, it seems like that summer I spent the majority of the summer filling Marilyn Manson back issue orders um, in the basement <laughs> of, of their office, which was in downtown Cleveland. Um, and one of the other interns was, so she had an evening job as an exotic dancer and I was, I mean, I wasn't even 21 at the time. And I think she found it very humorous to um, 
put herself in as close proximity as she could um, in the basement while we were filling these back issue orders just to see how like freaked out and frustrated <laughs> I get by by being in that close of proximity to to a beautiful um, young woman. Mm. Uh, but so so one of the other things I did was I would hand out mail, and they were getting a lot. I mean, they would get fifty or hundred promo packages a a day right so um i'd open them up i'd go through and i'd kind of redline the stuff that was bullshit in the press releases (laughs) and (laughs) kind of the who what when where why how information in and then i would deliver those to jason Pettigrew. and so one day um so so usually if he was on a call i i tried not to um, get into his office and, and, and interrupt him while he was doing the work. But so one day I kind of peeked in and he was on the phone and I went to, to move on and he, he uh, gestured for me to go in. And I remember him saying, so let me get this right. If Kurt Cobain was still alive, you guys would be in Africa doing a deep dive on tribal music and then he and then he flipped over kind of this this promotional picture and it was a picture of St- stone temple pilots <laughs> so what i was assuming was scott wheeland was blown out of his freaking gourd on the other end of this phone oh but jason God. just like trying to keep it together um and, <laughs> and having this ridiculously heinous conversation with scott wyland or wheeland <laughs> <laughs> the fact that that exists in reality makes me so happy <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm probably getting the details, uh, you know, the, the crew, the crucial details of that conversation, um, horribly wrong in, in my old age. I mean, it's been decades since that happened, but, uh, you know, um, that was a good summer. That was, I felt like I learned a lot that summer, um, and have, have kept in contact with Jason Pettigrew, um, all these years as a result of that. And I'm, you know, he, I don't know if he'd say that I'm uh, a friend, but I certainly consider him one of my friends. So that that's kind of amazing because that guy has one hell of a pedigree. Yeah. You know? Oh, he's, he's awesome. And uh, so, so anyway, so I started doing these online publications and, um, was blessed to have a friend, uh, Jason Laveris, who was a very talented photographer, and he started working for Strength Skateboarding Magazine, which was out of Cincinnati. Yeah. So he didn't want to write the articles; he just wanted to to um, do do the photography. So he sort of brought me on as a teammate in doing some features for Strength Skateboarding Magazine, and. Um, the benefit of not really getting paid is that I felt like I owned the copyright to <laughs> my interviews um, and, and my discussions. So, you know, I, I began being able to put interviews with the faint on yeah. the website or the blood brothers or Icarus line, you know, yeah. um, so some of those folks and, and, and was able to, to start to see a following as a result of that. So um, I've done freelance at, at a variety of places, kind of um, having fallen into it in those same ways, just having known somebody that was working there and asking if it, you know, if they might be able to, to use some of my writing um, and, and have been really lucky to, um, have worked uh, with some alt weeklies, um, with some awesome online publications, and then uh, there are two mag, you know, publications that I continue to work with uh, today: uh, New Noise Magazine and Get a Blaster mm-hmm. Magazine. And I love the publishers of both of those magazines, Eddie and Lisa. 
Uh, so Eddie is the publisher of Get a Blaster and Lisa Rue is the publisher of uh, New Noise Magazine. And they've been just uh, incredible champions of, uh, uh, of, of me as a person and my writing um, and, and just stellar human beings. So um, about 10 years ago, I started to get opportunities to do um, cover stories mm. or multi-page features. And unfortunately, around that time, um, the, it was sort of pre-Me Too, um, but it was becoming more common to see people coming out and saying, like, this band did this fucked up thing. And then mm-hmm. there being um, a, a converse, a, you know, a very public conversation about that. And unfortunately, um, some of the folks that I was spending a lot of time doing multi-page features on um, were people that were, you know, for all intents and purposes. And I can't say because I wasn't there, but, you know, my tendency is to believe somebody that's brave enough to... Uh, you know, challenge, challenge yeah. somebody's shitty behavior and uh, abuse of the power dynamic that they have as as uh, a musician or a, a popular artist. So I was spending a lot of time doing these features, and then couldn't even be proud to hang some of them, some of the cover stories even on my wall. So I thought to, my, to myself at that time. Now at that time, I I mean I was the web editor for get a blaster magazine. Um, I was also doing web editing for new noise magazine. So I was probably doing somewhere between five and 700 features a year Mm -hmm. um, for, for online um, and in some smaller fraction of that for print. And um, being from Dayton, um, you know, had friends that I'd known for decades uh, who were playing in bands who would go into the studio, record, uh, pay to mix and well, pay to record, pay to mix and master their stuff. Um, <laughs> Dayton's a funny place. So like it was probably just like 2018 or 2019 when it became common practice for shows not to be a $5 door charge. Mm-hmm. They, they kind of graduated into $10, but I mean, we were at Fugazi prices, like door prices, like well into almost 20, you know, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the, the late 20 teens. Right. Yeah. So, so the, these are bands that are, are great bands that aren't making a tremendous amount of money um, at at their local live gigs who are paying out of pocket to, to come up with these physical products. And the last thing they, they have is access to the money to do, uh, uh, you know, to, to work with a professional publicist to do a PR campaign. And, you know, what really illuminated that for me was when my brother's band um, went to shop a publicist uh for for one of their records and um so i had recommended several that i had worked with for decades and they couldn't even get a call with people that i'd known for like 20 years and then they did end up getting a call with one guy and he told them he'd do it he'd do a month-long campaign and it was going to cost them twelve hundred dollars which was interesting because there was another band locally that had used the same guy and for the same effort, it was 800. Yeah. So there was a markup on, on their stuff. And uh, so I, you know, I had started doing PR for, for, for some local bands. And, and I said to uh, my brother, I said, let's just do this ourselves, uh, you know, ourselves. And we spent seven months sending thousands of emails uh, to, to folks to, <laughs> to try and get them to listen to this record that his band had done. Yeah. And 
at the end of it, they had dozens of nice um, features, uh, you know, and uh, probably close to 10 or 12. Uh, they ended up on close to 10 or 12 best of uh, lists that year. And, um, you know, in, in the course of doing that, we also grew the press list that I was using to a, a few thousand people. So I really credit Joe um, and his tenacity um, with, with, uh, in, in his expertise in the world of marketing too. Uh, and, you know, that's what he does professionally. Um, in, I, I guess, sharpening the, the, the endeavor that I, I, I had begun, uh, it, with Sweet Cheetah. So, um, so that said, uh, you know, Sweet Cheetah is not like a professional PR company. Um, mm -hmm. it is a pro bono effort, uh, of, of, we, we sort of try and mimic uh, professional PR to the best of our abilities. Um, and we do it for our friends um, and friends of friends for free. Mm -hmm. um, and have been fortunate to get some really um, nice referrals from people that we've met along the way. Um, and, ha you know, have been able to nurture some some relationships that that we had you know sort of built when we were just young punks um so for instance one of one of the relationships that's been kind of long long standing in terms of uh pr for for sweet cheetah has been with earthquaker devices yeah so uh you know i met jamie stillman i was in college he was still in high school and he was playing in Harriet the Spy. Um, he was playing in the Party Helicopters, uh, who are one of my very favorite bands of all time. Um, and uh, he was kind of a, a young musician. And then um, some years later, there was a woman who was uh, based out of Northern Ohio. He was doing booking for just a ton of bands, The Faint, The Flying Lutenbachers, XBXRX. Uh, just a ton, you know, a ton of amazing bands. Um, and she at the time was a single mother who was uh, in college and then running this sort of thriving booking business on the side. And that was Julie Robbins, who um, is the CEO now of, of Earthquaker Devices and is married to Jamie Stillman, who designs uh the the guitar pedal product um yeah. an amazing product uh that 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 company produces so uh i can't recall what year it was but i do know it was around it was around valentine's day i got an email from julie robbins and she said hey what do you think about maybe doing some some pr work for us and i was like yes 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 please <laughs> you know mm -hmm. So um, it's those kind of um, relationships and friendships that have become the uh, you know the the workload that that we sort of carry today with regards to uh, Sweet Cheetah. Um, it's if it's not people we've known for twenty years or more, it's people that have known our friends for 20 years or more. Um, yeah. and, and, and so it's really been a labor of love and, and such a pleasure to get to know um, each and every one of the artists that we've worked with. And uh, I, I can say with a hundred percent certainty that Sweet Cheetah has, has been uh, a, a, a curated endeavor in that we've loved every single thing that we've, uh, you know, put out into the universe, uh, or been trusted to put out into the universe and, and to draw attention to. So, and, and I'm really proud of that.
there's there's nothing that we've done uh, that somebody could kind of goof on on me about and be like, yeah, but he did this thing, you know, right. all, all, like even there, I'm I'm not saying there's not some goofy shit we've done, um, but what? but it's but but it's intentionally goofy, you know, it, it, if you understand the the intent of some of the things it, it's a lot less goofy so for instance um uh some of my friends from here in dayton have a band called the night beast uh yeah. that um <laughs> you know for all intents and purposes like is sounds very much like smash mouth mm-hmm. and uh I remember trying to get people to pay attention to them um, in, in, in to sort of understand the, the brilliance of, uh, of what they were doing or, or what I thought was the brilliance of what they were doing and having people be like, dude, this sounds like smash. Milk. And I was like, yes, it does. And that's why it's great. <laughs> you know? So, but uh, I, I think to, to kind of put a finer point on it though, Everything that you do with your project with with Sweet Cheetah is is congruent to everything I do with this show because I don't have like like I don't I don't get guests on here that I don't care about. You know, like the, the whole credo of of my mission is everyone I have on this show is a band or an author or or whatever it's something that i care about it's something that i have a personal attachment to and that's exactly what you do with 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 that and it's it's really interesting the way uh we kind of got together and uh i legitimately would not be as far in this endeavor there goes my camera in this endeavor had it not been for our meeting you know and and that really comes down to nicole well so yeah well so nicole and i met in a really really funny way um so i'd worked for several years with um a publicist and soft kill was using this publicist at the time and i took notice of them because um conrad volmer volmer uh, was the guitarist and he and I went to college together. He had also played in some um, bands with some friends of mine. Uh, he was in a band called Cinema Eye uh, with some really good friends of mine. And uh, I was just liked Conrad as a person. He's just a really, really nice person. So um, there were some things in that original press release that made my spidey senses sort of tingle. Um, mm-hmm. And that was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but um, part of my, the conversation that led me to Nicole was like, do I really want to do this given uh, Tobias's uh, criminal history? Right. Um, right. With, you know, which was sort of called out in the press release. And so their, their publicist at the time said, well, um, you know, don't take my word for it. Talk to the band about it and put me in touch with Nicole. And um, we, you know, we had a, a, a really nice conversation and um, I was convinced I, I already loved the music. Yeah. Um, it was just one of those things where I'd been burnt enough times, um, you know, in the past by, uh, you know, spending time on folks that were, again, abusing their power dynamic or, you know, just doing some really shitty stuff um, that I, I I just kind of wanted the uh, assurance that my time was going to be well spent and and she convinced me that it would be. And yeah. and Nicole and I became friends um, and have, have remained friends since then. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what led me to you was uh, hearing her on the podcast and then what kept me polarized with regards to, uh, you know, the book of very, very bad things was your, your interview style. 
mm. um, your ability to really like get to the root of what makes people tick as a human being and, a, and an artist. And I just really appreciated that about it. So, um, you know, when as, as somebody who's done hundreds of interviews myself, like I'd really rather have an, a, a conversation with an artist that's interesting for both of us than be asking them shit out of their press package, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you because know, like, like, we've we've all been there. We've all been like, oh, so how long have you been vegetarian, vegan slash straight edge? Like, who cares? That yeah. has nothing to do with like y- your father abandoning you or you know whatever happened to you. Whereas if you take twenty minutes to really dive into a conversation with a human being on a very, very just like austere level, get into body language. And, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, give people the idea that I, I'm some sort of expert as far as so, like sociology, but I, I do having been, having come from a very, uh, sordid place, uh, in, yeah. in, in, my, in my life, like be it, you know, w- via addiction, via a lot of the things I've, I've, uh, conquered <laughs> throughout the, uh, throughout the length and breadth of my life. I, I I've learned how to read people and sure. I've learned how to love people in that respect. Whereas, you know, a lot, people can become very jaded through trials and tribulations. Whereas I learned how to have empathy. So I approach with empathy always. And I I kind of just disabuse people of the notion that they have to be guarded around me. And it's always work. And you want to talk to people about things that interest them and having the same conversation hour after hour, day after day about some product that they're trying to sell may not be the most important conversation that or the conversation that they want to have at that moment so yeah uh, hey this this is a really uh i I guess sort of poor anecdote but so i was doing the podcast for a while um and and you can find it uh online it was called soundcheck chat Yep. And uh, I, I had a friend that I was working with at the Alt Weekly uh, here in Dayton who took a job as the head of PR for Psychopathic Records. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Insane Clowns and moved yep. to Detroit to do that. And so he was always sort of pitching me things that were crazy, you know, Insane Clown related uh, yep. psychopathic artists. And, and one of the artists he pitched me, um, which was probably one of my favorite interviews uh, I've ever done, was with an artist uh, who goes by the moniker Blaze Your Dead Homie. No, oh, I remember Blaze Your Dead Homie, yeah. <laughs> and he and I had so much fun um, talking about, like, the first Nintendo system he got as a kid. And how he would challenge his brother to these, uh, you know, uh, excite bike, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges. And then, you know, in, in this, I, I guess I'm going to out myself as kind of a shitty journalist. Like, I hadn't listened to a whole lot of Blaze Your Dead Homie, right? Mm-hmm. I'd listened to a couple songs, so I didn't have a tremendous amount to say to him with regards to his art. So it was kind of out of necessity that we were talking about other things. But so that he had just been on this tour to Australia. And so, you know, the, the thing that I could think to ask him was if he had gone to one of those, uh, you know, petting zoo tourist activities where you could hold a koala bear. Yeah, And he said, well, yeah, I went to one of those, but I wasn't trying to hold one of them shits. And I said, well, what do you mean you weren't trying to hold one? It seems like you would be down to hold a koala bear. Like, all they want to do is, like, 
eat eucalyptus, get high, take some naps, <laughs> get with koala honeys. Like he was like, yeah, I wasn't trying to hold one because the guy at the place told me that they have the clap. And I was like, so wait, hold on. <laughs> You're worried about getting the clap from holding a koala. And he's like, yeah, he is like, I wasn't going to risk it. I was like, dude, if you get chlamydia holding a bear, you are holding it wrong. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> he was like, I'm telling you, I wasn't trying, I, I, I wasn't <clears throat> trying to get the clap from a bear. So after <laughs> I, did the interview, I got on the internet and I'm like, I have to know if he was pulling my leg or if, like this was a thing that is really a thing and sure enough chlamydia can be transmitted transmitted bear to human oh my and god Asia that homie was doing the smart thing now i've seen hawthorne heights pictures over <laughs> in Australia holding those bears i've seen you know pictures of other bands holding those bears they are not as as astute as my man blazed that homie yeah, he's I, I not, mean, you got you, you kind of have to take your hat off. He, <laughs> he he doesn't have the drip from from holding a koala. <laughs> no, the other thing I really uh, appreciated about him was uh, as we were talking about the N Nintendo Entertainment System, he kept calling it the Nintendo, which the I just Nintendo, found so yeah. yeah, I I just found so like. I, I'm just likable. <laughs> like, it really gave me an affinity for him uh, that that he was calling it the Nintendo. Um, team, well, so. uh, shout when, out when, to Blaze Dead Homie. You're you're one of my favorites. I, so. I actually love Blaze Dead Homie. Um, I am not a Psychopathic Records fan per se, but I definitely uh, I definitely like their aesthetic. I like the fact that it's it's a it's its own world. It's very insular. It's very unique and unto itself, and uh, feeds itself in a very punk rock kind of way. Uh, well, and it's people... just smart in terms of the business practice. I mean, they yeah. bought up anybody who would have potentially been a competitor. Yeah, yeah, and they marketed the shit out of themselves um and and two um I, I i think hopefully you'll have jason weber on on the show at yeah. some point to talk about his time at psychopathic records but jason's an absolute genius as a publicist and really turned the national conversation about the insane clown posse uh he 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 transformed that conversation a hundred percent Especially considering they were really trying to villainize what can truly be, you know, kind of put in the same area as professional wrestling or horror yeah. film. It's just, I don't want to call it a shtick because it, it, it is, but it isn't. It, it's its own genre. It's its own vibe. They took uh, what, you know, the grave diggers, and you know the horror core artists within uh, uh, the greater confines of hip hop, and made it into their own idea. It, it, it's its own thing. They they legitimately revolutionized a very tiny microcosm of the greater universe of hip hop, and made it their own in a very very real way. Uh, you can call it, you know, like, yeah, they're capitalizing on something. Yeah, of course. But they're capitalizing. They're also on... giving back to their fan base in, in ways they that are. you don't see that are typical of artists of their, I guess, station, right? Well, so, who would, so who would think Insane Clown Posse would bring Dimmu Borger and Converge on tour? But they did it. Yeah, and, and and the fact that they would think, okay, th these are like-minded people. These are people who, uh, you know, also very dissimilar sonically, have a similar uh, 
idea of, of of community let's bring them let's open our minds to them so let's talk about converge for a second so yeah. i don't know if you you know I, i'm sure you already know this but uh, so converge was not a popular hardcore band in the 90s they were doing something that no they weren't they were really a similar they were to what was popular at the time that they were sort of diminished um in 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 the minds of uh you know the typical fan of that that hardcore style at the time i i don't think there were a lot of people admitting that they were no. as they were it wasn't how many years later that people kind of got mm-hmm. You know, so they were outliers in the same way that in Vain Clown Posse had an outliers in, in their genre. Con- Converge know? were very, uh, at when they'd first started, very, very emo, as it were, and not in the uh, fashion of the late 90s, early aughts emo, and also not in the same fashion as Embrace was. Uh, Jacob Bannon had a very whiny, very, uh, like affected voice he was it was depressing almost in its way uh before they got really metallic when converge were first a band it was it was it was hard to swallow for a lot of people because it it was so caustic in its in its whininess per se people didn't get it people didn't get it and it wasn't until uh, forever comes crashing when they started to really be the converge that everyone else knows now they didn't cement that until jane doe but before that when forever comes crashing was like the definitive statement of of what they were to become because it got more of the, of the metallic vibes but th- yeah they weren't they weren't embraced accepted and loved universally the way they are right now it didn't oh, happen for sure. Yeah. S- same thing with your, your stark weathers and, and your bloodlets and your dead guys. There was a point in, in all of those career trajectories where they were like, people were like, wait, wait a minute. This doesn't sound like, you know, earth crisis. This doesn't sound like sick of it all. This doesn't sound like mad ball or, or whomever. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a whole other conversation. I mean, I liked Sepultura when Sepultura did it, but you know, <laughs> there's a, uh, uh, and that's no slight against Hatebreed. They just were never my flavor. Uh, I like hardcore that's, you know, take early sick of it all and corrosion of conformity and like minor threat. That's that's hardcore to me it just becomes different forms of metal at some point. But, you know, like there, there was something that set these people apart and there were, you know, personalities involved. And these personalities were what shaped the faces of these bands, be it, you know, the whininess of early Converge or the, the psychosis of Stark Weather or the complete like psychedelia of neurosis, my all time favorite band the like the, we took these things into consideration and you take somebody like insane clown posse. They're really unlike, if, unless you take into consideration cage or, you know, LP in his earlier iterations. Uh, there weren't that many, voices in in the confines of hip-hop that were doing something that was utterly other sure you know, you know and and i i am not an icp fan per se but i do appreciate that i appreciate yeah. that there is a punk rock oeuvre to what they put forth well so a couple things so uh Remind me to get back to a really interesting conversation I had with Nicole from Softkill not that long ago. But so uh, one of the things that um, I was invited to do um, when when Jason was at 
psychopathic was Insane Clown Posse had come to Dayton to do a benefit show for a fan who was in hospice. And um, they, mm -hmm. so Violent J had driven from Detroit to Ohio to see this fan um, who, who they were kind of alerted to through one of the, the juggalo message boards. He, he came down the week of after Christmas <clears throat> to see this fan and bring him some, tr to try to bring him some joy. Uh, and, and so part of the conversation that they had, um, he was really sick. And um, so they made a commitment to his mother to come back to Dayton when he passed to raise money for his funeral expenses. So, so it was around, well, the, the show ended up being on St. Patrick's day. And um, so St. Clown Posse was true to their word and this sold out show in Dayton to raise money for the family of, of this fan who had passed. <coughs> anyway, so at, at the time I was married to my ex and I said, I'm going to um, go and meet Jason at this insane clown posse concert that he's working. And she said, why? And I said, because J Jason and I are friends and I feel like I'd like to go see him. So she drives me to downtown Dayton and um, she says, I'm not dropping you off here. And I said, yeah, it will, it will be fine. And she said, no, this is like Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. And that thing is you. <laughs> and I was like, I'm fine. <laughs> like, it'll, it'll be cool. So anyway, she, she begrudgingly drops me off. And um, uh, so, so get into the venue and, and mix with Jason and, and, and really just observing the culture. And I can say that I was tremendously impressed by um, the spirit uh, uh, and, and, and real um, feeling of community that that, that group of people had. Um, I will also say, and, and I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say this, like the Juggalos are not the well-loved people of their communities right so right. these are people that have not been maybe well taken care of by their families not well served by their economic standing not well served <laughs> by their their school systems and their communities yeah. like these are some rough folks right um so uh a couple hours later, I get a text from my wife and she says, okay, I'm going to come back and get you. And I said, okay, great. And um, so walked out and got into the car and she says to me, you haven't been smoking weed, have you? Mm -hmm. And I don't smoke marijuana. So I was like, no, why? And she said, you smell like you've been in a closet pulling bong rips all night. Now, this venue, this is after, like, smoking is not a thing in Ohio anymore. So yeah. th there's not smoking in this venue. Like, this is just the natural, um, I, I guess, musk of having mixed with 500 juggalos for a couple hours. <laughs> it's just, you walk out, <clears throat> like you've been pulling bong rips in a closet all night. Yeah. And 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 the best uh, the best explanation I could give her was like it's just juggalo breath. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I, my hats off to them because you know even in Pennsylvania, I I told you about this. There were there were murders that were attributed to that whole fandom that sh like listen you can be a fan of anything and kill someone that's that's yeah happenstance you know i've i've never listened to a song or a band that 
convinced me that it was my time to go out and end life. It just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. I, I, I call it what you I, will. You no, know, I think that just happens with with people that are that are in sort of these polarized kind of fandoms too. Like my friend's sister was a deadhead, mm -hmm. traveled around with them, and she was not well served as a person by having dropped out of college and traveled with the Grateful Dead. Yeah, but you know, uh, yeah. It's not, but that's not Jerry Garcia. But it's not fault. the fault of Jerry Garcia or yeah. Bob. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That 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 has to do more with <laughs> nature versus nurture, as we'd said. And you know, in the same token, uh, growing up in this area, there were uh, unfortunately there there had been two young men who had committed suicide when I was in maybe. Uh, 11th grade and one of these two young gentlemen had the demo tape of the band I'd been in at the time and we'd received phone calls from the local authorities because my phone number was directly in the demo tapes well, as they were, right? yeah. yeah as they were as you know there's no URL to conceive of at that point uh, and in the newspaper for my parents to read uh, was the name of the band I'd been in at that time uh, tied to this double suicide by these two young men who were very confused homosexuals uh, growing up in very rural, very Christian northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, that, and you know that's just lazy journalism, and that was happening. It is. It that is. that was happening in Dayton too when I was in high school. I remember there used there was some sort of sensationalized Sunday uh, morning front page feature on Straight Edge, and yeah, you know, in that kind of stuff. I know emo's been through the ringer the same way, and you know, mm -hmm. like it's just people misunderstanding that there's more to the human experience than the music somebody is listening to. And I think it's very astute of you to say, like, it was a, you know, it was, it wasn't about like having the demo tape of your band. It mm -hmm. was about two people that had a lot more going on. <laughs> and, and so. the only thing I could say about my involvement is, even though it came to a terrible end. Thank God that for a moment in the lives of these young men, that they had found solace in something I had to do with. I, I just wish they'd gleaned a more positive message from what I was putting forth. Yeah. And, and to me, that's, I do consider that sort of a failure but in the same token, I, I can't control the way anyone takes what I put forth into the world. Uh, you know, and I still make music and I, it is still oblique in its way uh, via the Dylan Thomas of it all. But with the podcast, with what, what I'm trying to do in this venue, it's very clear cut. I'm just trying to, you know, express jubilation via the music that I enjoy and the writing that I enjoy and the people that I enjoy being surrounded by. And which I, is so different than what so many others are doing too. Like I, I get so frustrated in this, in the music culture, because it seems like if something gets sensationalized or it has like, a negative context, like, uh, or, or context for whatever reason, like, mm -hmm. that's where the emphasis goes. Right. So, like, like when I was so frustrated trying to pitch something that I thought was really great, like the week that every time I die broke up. Yeah. And I'm like, how many freaking column inches? Do we need to read of the back and forth between the members of every time I die, like really not liking each other? Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
yeah, um, and and they are brothers. Two of them are brothers, so it's kind of a bummer. But let's let's face it, they're just a band, just like that that Scroobius Pip song, Minor Threat was just a band. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like well, it, let, let's give them some time and space to work their shit yeah. out. You know what I mean? Like how many? Yeah. Uh, how many articles do we need like talking about the what one guy says versus the other guy or whatever and, anyway that's neither here nor there but i that you know i'd rather spend t- two hours listening to you like have a real honest discussion um that goes to a lot of different places that goes to um mm-hmm. You know, funny places, joyful places, sad places, you know, and and kind of runs the gamut of human experience rather than, you know, spend two minutes reading about what's that, uh, that stupid band that was um, fighting with Power Trip. Oh, uh, Uh, Trapped, Trapped. Yeah, how much, how many column inches did that stupid ass band Trapped get? And I'm like, they weren't why, they why were not stupid about it good. <laughs> but they weren't stupid about it they knew that they had ca- uh captured some part of a zeitgeist because they're yeah. not only are they shitting all over you know uh everything that power trip had to say but you know danny diablo's popping in and ice tea's popping in yeah and uh, and and this is the most heat that piece of shit band has had on them since they yeah. were a band well you know what i would have shut my fucking mouth once ice tea got into the conversation i would have tried to yeah. with ice tea but, but <laughs> i mean that just speaks to the uh lack of intelligence on the part of the right. guy from trapped like okay i'm gonna screw with a guy who's like vetted and approved and can walk through any gang infested territory ever and not be touched Right. I'm not going to fuck with him. No, but right. that didn't occur to this guy. Apparently he just went for it. Uh, but I think like the point I'm really trying to drive home with what is special about what you do and what you do for me is I'd gone from, you know, having conversations with like arguably some pretty important bands through Lycia through soft kill and then uh, you and I tangle with one another and I kind of go to another level at that point. And it happens really quickly and, and in, in a very tangible way. Uh, and that definitely has to do with the fact that you, even before you were officially my publicist, uh, you were already pulling for me and saying like, hey, I talked to Nicole, Nicole, and Nicole, this is all Nicole's fault. And I thank her for it. Um, You know, she kind of said like, this is someone you should talk to about something like this. Uh, And that would have been Mr. Broach. (laughs) And uh, he needed somewhere to kind of like air what he'd been through. And I, I well, needed know. somebody that you could trust that heavy conversation with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, who do you trust with the conversation of having dealt with cancer during uh, the pandemic? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, and Chris is a father of you know, beautiful young kids. He's a Mm -hmm. husband. He's a brother. Like he's somebody's kid. Like he's not just like Chris Broach from Braid. Like he's a human being. And who do you trust to treat him like a human being and talk about that, you know, experience that he had and, and, and communicate the gravity of it, you know? Um, and and I knew immediately after hearing your conversations with others that like you were going to be, uh, you know, the right kind of person to have that conversation. Um, so while we're <laughs> while we're on the subject of Nicole, yeah, I do want to tell you this story. So okay, um, I was talking to Nicole some months ago, and she said, you know, Tim, I just can't get around 
the sweet cheetah name. She was like, <laughs> she was like, you're, you know, you're a nice guy or whatever, but, but like, is it a martyr complex that you think you're the sweet cheetah? And, and, <laughs> and like, it's just a dumb name. And in, in the fact that you see yourself like that is also dumb. And I said, Nicole, I am not the sweet cheetah. I said, the reason why I called sweet cheetah publicity sweet cheetah was I want people to be like, sweet cheetah, that band is fucking awesome. (laughs) 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 And she was like, okay, it's not lame. I th- I think people need to think of it in the context of the logo too, because you see this like exaggerated, cartoonish, cute figure. Okay, of 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 this cheetah, and and it looks cuddly, and <laughs> it, it could still fucking kill you, but it's cuddly right. and cute. <laughs> So there's the duality of, of, of it's sweet, but it's, you know, still, it's still so a fucking the, cheetah. The logo didn't have that much thought, as much thought as the name did. So the the guy who did the logo um, is my friend Dan Reiser, who's a super super talented um, yeah. noise artist in 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 his own right and an incredible artist, but. You know, I I had asked him sort of as a favor. I I actually traded his logo work for a um, Earthquaker Devices uh, disaster transport pedal. (laughs) (laughs) Great for a noise artist. Yeah. So um, I was like, so my my son, when he was growing up uh, or when he was little, was obsessed with Shrek. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't know why it was Shrek that he attached or or to, but like Shrek was his dude. Like, and, and he was so obsessed with the first Shrek movie that like, I was out like searching any Shrek shit that I could find because I'm like, I can't watch this movie (laughs) over and over and over and over and over again. So anyway, when when I was thinking about the logo, I was like, you know, Puss in Boots from Shrek when he like makes his nice face um, mm-hmm. before he like gets all like awesome in uh, swashbuckly, <laughs> you know, that's his swashbuckle adventure, cool sword fighting shit. Like that's what I want it to look like. <laughs> and so uh that <laughs> puss and boots from shrek was kind of the inspiration for that but dan did an incredible job with that logo and i really love it so. oh yeah it's striking it's uh memorable and furthermore it i think it does kind of pick up that dichotomy that i'm talking about where it's like yeah it's sweet it's cute look at how cute it is but it's still a cheetah <laughs> yeah n- 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 nicole was the only person that's ever been like dude what's up with the sweet cheetah thing and then it, 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 it was a funny it was a funny conversation to have but that that that's very much nicole because she will legitimately dissect oh right? nicole nicole is, one of the, is easily one of the smartest people that I've uh, ever met in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I feel pretty blessed to know a lot of like legitimately brilliant um, people um, and women in particular, like Julie Robbins from, from Earthquaker Devices is easily one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Um, mm. Certainly one of the most hardworking uh, just an incredible, incredible businesswoman, and and I see Nicole through the same lens, like just incredibly, incredibly brilliant. Um, the um, the amount of nuance you can learn about music and culture, like talking to Nicole for like fifteen minutes, is like <laughs> mind boggling. Like yeah. shit. It, like if you want your head to hurt, like talk to Nicole for thirty minutes because you're gonna be <laughs> thinking about the shit that she said for like the next three months. 
and it's the same with with my wife tiana i would not this wouldn't be happening i wouldn't even be here had it not been for her being completely fed up with my <laughs> punting around the house like uh you know just chasing the baby uh during covid lockdown and you know she's pete you're not writing you're not playing music you're not doing anything other than playing with Kanan and that's great but well and hats off to her for like recognizing something that you're really really good at and then showing you the grace to encourage you in that and mm -hmm. and giving you the time and space to do it you know yeah. so so many well so many spouses so many people that I, and maybe I've just been in some dysfunctional relationships, but it's really easy to like be resented for the amount of time that you want to spend um, on a passion project um, by somebody that you're in uh, a romantic relationship with or, or a domestic relationship with yeah. and to have her like, encourage and show you that grace just shows like what kind of person she is at her core and in in i i i already know the kind of person that she is yeah you know you you've nailed it so. having not having never met my wife or or speaking to her you've you've encapsulated her persona my wife is just legitimately my number one fan my cheerleader my uh she's the rock upon which peter builds his church you know she she helps me personify the 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 idea behind my name uh and that's that's a success right there as far as a, uh anything a partner could be you know don't even call her a wife that's just she's my partner and right yeah, that that's completion beyond words i I, I'm gushing about my own wife, but yes, yeah, my. Well, I think that's a, you know that's an important conversation to have too. Like, I I don't know. I mean, I don't want to get too. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much, but like, right. you know, <laughs> marriages and romantic relationships are so like dispensable. Yeah. Um, you know, now and, you know, having briefly like looked at dating websites and stuff like that, like I can see how, like why it would be that way because yeah. you're forced into engaging, like gauging your interest about somebody based solely on their looks. And then like, as you're scrolling or like you know swiping or whatever you're like but is this the hottest person that i could probably talk to like it's so disingenuous uh -huh. um and you know part of the really the really beautiful thing um when two people find and out the best in each other um in in then you know, stick around and, you know, on days when it's sucky, yeah. like that's, that's really awesome to me, you know, and, and my parents. And that's how we met. That's how we met. Tiana and I met online. She was my yeah. neighbor. We lived a block away from each other and we had to oh, meet wow. online. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to look at her, uh, profile picture which was not a lie that's that was exactly how attractive my wife was which is way too attractive for me i i, I looked at her i was like oh my god well, i don't know you're not, you're not a bad looking guy i'd smash <laughs> <laughs> that's why michael malarkey keeps coming back i guess but you know uh, like I, I, i'd smash michael too yeah, well, everybody. Was, you you haven't me. lived until you've seen Michael eat a corn dog that has four <laughs> different types of meat in it. I I can say that I'm that boy likes his meat. Yeah, I'm one of the blessed few <laughs> that have 
seen Michael Malarkey eat a corn dog that was comprised of three or more types of meat. <laughs> I've got a picture of it somewhere. I'll send it to you. I have to, I have to see it. And Michael's going to hear this because <laughs> you know, I steal all your friends apparently, Tim, but I, know. <laughs> I, was, I was just giving you a hard time. I know, I know, but you know, Malarkey and I just kind of hit it off after the podcast. Well, and you're, just, touch. you're just, you're just cooler than I am. I, I yeah. mean, you can't, you can't help that. I don't, I don't yeah. know. I don't think that's the case, Tim. I just think that I know. I know. we we attract the same kind of people, and yeah. you know, he and I just we we clicked, and. No, Mike's my you know Michael's an an awesome dude, and he's. Yeah. He's really easy to like as a person. He's got a lot of interesting things to say and has had some really interesting experiences. And um, and he's not full of shit. And he's not full of shit. And he's not, like, unapproachable, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of had the benefit of knowing Michael before, like, he had a career in the public eye. Yeah. Um. You know, he was a weirdo from a suburb of Dayton playing in a hardcore band with some friends yeah. of mine. Um, but I didn't know him that well at the time. I didn't meet him until he was already in the public eye. But I think the reason we clicked immediately was that that uh, kind of I, I describe it as kind of that Midwestern nature. Mm -hmm. Um you know, he like he carries himself like like the people that I've known all my life. Uh, you know, so it so one thing that was really funny um, was did you ever watch Robin Big? Yeah, of course. Okay, so Rob Deerdick is from Kettering, Ohio, um, mm -hmm. which is a suburb of Dayton, and. Um, one of the things that always sort of tickled me about Robin Big was my mom loved the show. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you you love this show more than I do. Like, why do you love it so much? And she was just like, it just is Dayton humor. Like, she's like, it just reminds me of all the kid, the guys that like you always had over here in <laughs> high school and, and the goofy shit you would say and you know, do to, to crack each other up and stuff. And, um, so, but I, I, I gotta say, so this is, this is my last, uh, Marlene Andrew anecdote, but, um, so my mom and I have the same kind of taste in, uh, in, in affinity for terrible television. Um, <laughs> one of the shows that, I continue to watch to this day. I don't know if she does, but I still watch it. Um, but my, my mom really, really liked uh, Little People, Big World. Oh, that was my gosh. Her favorite show. Yeah, yeah. So when I first started dating my ex-wife, my sister, for she came with us me to Christmas, and my sister had gotten my mom for Christmas back when DVD box sets were a thing was yeah. the DVD box set for whatever the most recent season of little people, big world was. Yeah. And so she opened it and said, Oh, little people, big world. And, and, and my ex looked at me kind of side eyed and, <laughs> and, and a little perplexed. And, and so my mom saw that interaction and she said, well, Amy, you know, I, I just have to let you know that the I love Little People Big World. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I love it is because when I was growing up, my best friend was a dwarf. Mm -hmm. And the room just went, you know, went silent. Like we knew my mom's best friend growing up was a dwarf, but we were all kind of waiting to see how Amy would respond. And, and she wasn't necessarily responding. So all I could think to say in that moment was, yeah, her best friend was a dwarf, and her other best friend was a dragon, and her other best friend was a unicorn, and only she could see them. <laughs> and 
you know, you, you have to kind of wonder what kind of person wouldn't love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's there's a lot pretty... of shit going out on Little People Big World. I, I mean, we've been talking for two hours, so I won't get into it too much. But let me just say there's some drama going down in the Little People Big World sphere. And Matt Roloff's not looking like a very, not, a very good guy right now. I, you know, I'd heard allusions to the exact same thing. And it's going to be funny when that all kind of comes apart. But, you know, the, which speaking that... of, so to, to tie this back to soft kill, uh-huh. I remember seeing pictures on Nicole's social media of her and Tobias and Dominic at the roll off farms. Mm-hmm. And I was so jealous. <laughs> yeah. 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 And there was a, there was a lot of backlash over Nicole kind of being involved with Toby and people were pissed. I remember that. Um, People didn't know, I guess, that he was done when he was done. And it's kind of amazing that this guy who, very much like me, came from not only music, but from, from, you know, a depth of addiction that was so pervasive that, you know, you kind of can't help but indulge it's just it's part of who you are and then then you finally slough it off and no matter what happens you'll always be blamed for still being the person that you conquered and i always kind of have to give not only toby but nicole credit for having the strength of character and strength of conviction to continue to not only be in a relationship, but to have a child, have, have, have Dominic. Well, one of the nice things about Nicole, I think is like, she understands that not even just people in active addiction, but like people who are punk rockers in their twenties are going to do dumb shit. Like I did tons of dumb shit. Like, I still do tons of dumb shit. Of course you do. Like, you know, and my friends are going to forgive me for the dumb shit I do, or they're going to, like, not. (laughs) And, and the you know, the difference between me and Toby is, like, Toby's doing it under the, the, this lens because he is in an incredible band. Yeah. And making awesome art. Um. You know, so he's got a lot more eyes on him. Um, but that doesn't mean he can't make some mistakes and do some fucked up shit. And sure. certainly, like you're, I, I mean, I would, I would expect that you're probably more likely to do stupid shit when you're in active addiction. Yeah. But like, the truth of the the fact is, is like we're all humans and we're all going to do stupid shit. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we're going to be dirt bags. You know, and then how you deal with the consequences of that is, it, you know, that's what speaks to your character. That's the character. That's that's the human being behind it all, because we're all capable of doing horrible shit. It's it's in us. I mean, take it aside the, the angels of our greater natures. Uh, we're still people. We're still fallible. We make these mistakes, you know, we, we destroy relationships, but if there's someone who can see past all of the malady that is, uh, the failings of your personality and, and still embraces the core of who you are, you found the right person. And obviously that's what Nicole is to Tobias. Obviously that's what my wife Tiana is to me. Um, and I really recognize that that's a rare thing and that not everyone has that. And I, I do celebrate that without uh, holding it over other people's heads. Like I have this, that you don't like the. Yeah. God, why is your life so awesome? And 
my 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 life is my life is far from awesome. I I just made a really good choice with the woman I married. That's that's really what it came down to. Um, I, I have a I have a daughter with a woman who despises me. So, you know, you know my my ex wife lives across the street. Like uh-huh. my so my address is forty five and hers is forty eight. Yeah, and mm-hmm. like neither of us did anything shitty to each other. Like mm-hmm. we just had dissimilar goals and dissimilar ideas of, uh, uh, of what we wanted in a partnership and we tried our best to make it work and it didn't. Yeah. So, but, but the thing is like, now we have a kid and he's her, you know, her favorite person in the world. He's my favorite person in the world. You know, we never did anything shitty to each other. We were yeah. always, I mean, even, even the year we decided to get divorced, we all, we went on, we were like, ah, oh, thank God we finally made that decision. And then we had a really wonderful vacation together after awesome. we decided like this marriage is over, mm-hmm. you know, well, that's amazing. And that's, that's, that's uh, very adult well, just Healthy. let you put push all that resentment and bullshit aside, and then, and then reevaluate what what's important, you know. And again, it goes to character, right? Is yeah. like if I, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I mean, I don't feel like speculating too too much about like you know, people in bands and stuff and, and, and what their home lives are like. But I would imagine like once they can like get home and like be human beings and parts of their family again, yeah. like that's gotta be so much more fun than, I mean, fun in a different way, but yeah. you know, it's gotta be at least as rewarding as going out and playing, you yeah, know, a 500 cap room or something. More so, more so because the person that, you know, like, like who you are on stage. And I know this because I've been playing music my entire life, who I am on stage ends when I walk off stage. But when I come home to the people I love and the people who love me, I'm not that that's just a projection. That's, that's, that's an idea of a person that I'm, I'm, I'm aping. On, no matter how sincere I am in the context of performance, when I get home, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm dad. I'm husband. Do, do you find you know? that you like bands a lot more when you can see them not, when you can see the artist not just as the artist, but as like a human being? Yes. Yes, one that's million one of the, percent. That's one of the most fun things that I think about interviewing people is like, like there were some bands that I was kind of midland about, and then after talking to the people in the band for a half hour or something, I'm just like, you know what? They were so like, so kind and <laughs> considerate and and thoughtful, like. I think I really fucking like their band a lot more now. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. But I think that that uh, speaks to the, you know, the 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 hardcore punk of it all in, in both of our ethos. That you know, if someone is who they pretend or 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 espouse to be, it, it endears us to them so much more because it's not just this act like, you know, to the X I'm crucified or, or uh, I love animals. I don't eat them, which these things, these things are important to me as well. Maybe not the straight edge part because I never had been, but when you take into consideration the vegetarian vegan thing, that's very near and dear to my heart, but who you espouse to be morally in a very perfunctory level doesn't mean as much as who you are when you're dealing with people when you're not on stage when there are people who want to meet you just because they love your music and they love what you stand for and instead of disregarding you 
embrace you come out and you talk to people you you interact you you give that part of yourself that most musicians really don't you yeah. know i hated like, talking when, when i was in bands i hated talking about the music that i was performing mm-hmm. and part of it you know part of it's just like my my personality or whatever um mm-hmm. and you know, not, not necessarily, um, just my self-critical nature or whatever. Sure. Like, sure. I, I don't like being the center of attention. I don't like being congratulated on things. I, I have a really, mm. really hard time hearing compliments, yeah. but even aside from that, like, I don't want to talk about the music I just played. Like I'd rather talk about like, I don't know, like little people, big world, or or getting the clap from a koala bear, you know, like that's the. I mean, if I'm gonna have a conversation with somebody, I don't want to have a conversation about some four minute song that I wrote. Like, let's have a conversation about something hilarious and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> let's actually relate to one another, whereas yeah. you know, like you're a journalist you know better than almost anyone people talk to these artists and and what's your influence you know who were you listening to when this happened i don't care about that if if it's obvious i pick it up if it's not i can i can still infer it okay and it's up to interpretation and that's part of the fun what you don't get from the music is what what is the you know, tenor and timber of this person's voice when they're telling you something. Uh, are they engaged when you ask them questions? Are they forthcoming? Are they, you know, trying to skirt around the topic? Can there be a middle ground between what they're willing to give and what you're asking? And that's the fun. The Someday inter- you're going to have an artist come on the podcast and you're going to be like, I can hear pain in in the performance that you gave on this album and they're going to say you know i i really struggled growing up because i was born with a vestigial tail (laughs) you are going to lose your shit you're not going to be able to keep it together and that publicist is going to fire you forever from their from communication with their roster (laughs) if that ever happens it's your fault it's your fault (laughs) My my publicist, my friend, my publicist. That's your fault. <laughs> and I, I think I, I think before I let you go, it does stand to uh, be spoken of that you'd already been my publicist truly before I asked if you would be my publicist. You were getting me interviews. You were making these introductions uh and you had nothing to gain nothing to well, gain. I'm not, you know and here's the thing is like i'm not really a publicist like i'm a, i have friends and i want yeah. people to be exposed to the awesome things that my friends are doing yeah. and i so <laughs> somebody i was in a romantic relationship with used to call me a collector of weirdos and i very I've much been blamed for that I've been blamed for that. Legitimately because the same I thing. Lo- I want interesting, fun, cool, hilarious people in I want to be in the orbit of people that are awesome, hilarious, cool, fun. Yeah. And you are one of those people. So it's like, you know what? Even if you were just like, dude, I don't need a publicist. Like I, I don't care. Like I would still be listening to your podcast. I would still be yeah. telling people about it. I would still be telling people they need to go on your show. Like yeah. I, 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 I mean, I guess, like, I'd rather be a fan and cheerleader of people. Like, the publicity just is the is the digestible sort of tag that it has because I have to send yeah. emails to people and I have to sound like, I, I have to make it sound legitimate in some yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and, and and that's the way that that people will, I guess, open my email and email me back. Occasionally, <laughs> if I say I'm a publicist, 
But what I'd really rather be is like a huge fan and cheerleader for my friends. Yeah. Like I don't I don't I don't want to be remembered as Tim Mandrill was a really good publicist. Like I I want to be be able to say like Tim Mandrill really like championed what I was doing and was a, and, and and was really encouraging of it. And and that's my other ex- existential fear is like I don't want to leave this planet and have people be like, well, Tim Mandrill was a real dick. Like <laughs> he was always saying, a, you know, mean shit about the cool shit I thought I was doing. Like, yeah. I want to be, you know, I want to leave the planet and people be like, you know what? Tim Mandrill was a really good guy. And when I was doing this thing that I thought was really important, he was like, you're perfect for that. And, and, and it's really important that you're pursuing that because you're really good at it. Yeah. Like that's the guy I want to be, you know. I think I think to that end you are incredibly incredibly successful because uh it, there was a point certainly where I wasn't getting that kind of feedback and that's for certain. Uh there were a few people who were like, "Hey, it's really cool that you're mining this era of music or yeah that was pretty much it really um having people from lycia to softkill on and i legitimately had three episodes when you uh i guess nicole had suggested you get in touch with me or what have you and that is when it had become serious uh health was uh the third uh, artist that yeah, was great on. Yeah, amazing amazing group but <laughs> yeah, you know these are people who are obviously not discerning about who they will be uh <laughs> interviewed by i guess but thereafter it like I, I have to say i owe you a great debt of gratitude because i i don't I really doubt that I would be where I'm at right now. No, not, no, had it not no way, real. man. Because be, be, because I know the truth about this, which is like getting an email from friends that I have suggested go on your show and be like, "That was really, really awesome and really fun." Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and I mean. When Jay Robbins is like, that was re- that was really fun. Thank you so much for for telling me I should do that. Or when, like this week, um, and the show hasn't come out, so I won't say who it was, but mm-hmm. somebody from a band that I had have followed for like decades, I suggested that he go on the show, and he was like, that was really great. Thanks for suggesting that. Like, yeah. no, that's that's you, man. <laughs> that that has nothing to do with you know with with me i'm just a connector of people but understand this these connections would never have taken place had you not been the intermediary between these luminary people that i i really wouldn't have access to otherwise michael malarkey and i wouldn't talk to each other on a daily basis had it not been for you uh, Jay Robbins would not have been on my show. They're like, like these things, uh, these connections, the, 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 these tactile experiences uh, via voice would not occur had it not been for your involvement. Oh, so. can you know what? Can I tell you something? So mm-hmm. it's really, so it, it's really selfish of me because I want to ask all these people stuff mm-hmm. or, or whatever. But I'm like, what if I say something goofy as hell? And then they're they're gonna be like, Tim just asked me the goofiest shit. So I'm like, I will just send them to Peter and he will ask them all the goofy shit. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, and so so to that end, okay, so here's my last story of the night. Okay. So do you remember that picture of Glenn Danzig carrying kitty litter? out of a grocery store yeah yeah i do so there there (laughs) there was a um 
a, a, a journalist that I was friends with uh, some years ago who uh, were not really connected anymore and, and for good reason because I I created quite, quite a, a problematic situation for him. So he's on his social media and he's like, I'm interviewing Glenn Danzig in a half an hour. So if you have anything I should ask him about, <laughs> let me know what it is. So I was like, dude, you got to ask him about <laughs> what brand of kitty litter he prefers. Like what, what brand is he going to, going to make sure that his cats have <laughs> so that they are, that they and he are well served. <laughs> he's making so he he worked it into his interview questions and he asked Glenn Danzig about that photo and Glenn Danzig lost his shit really it lost his shit I'll have to send you so it actually went kind of viral this interview did because Glenn Danzig was so pissed about it, it I mean it was on Rolling Stone online <laughs> lost his shit over this question like that's how monumentally bad it went so the the interviewer's name is sean i can't remember his last name right now but i'll, I'll send you a, a link later but uh, sorry sean sorry for doing that to you buddy <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> so anyway that that's really why i why, so to wrap this whole thing up uh -huh. the reason why i'm your publicist is because then i can try and get you to ask people the goofy shit i want to ask them <laughs> um without getting yelled at <laughs> so i i'm the, i'm the foil for your <laughs> Id. <laughs> that's beautiful oh my god all right uh, so anybody I, that's listening to this that knows me knows how absolutely full of shit i am um so just caveat <laughs> like i'm not being serious about this like i'm not Sending Peter out in the world to ask people goofy shit like he's a legitimate <laughs> journalist. <laughs> if I'm a legitimate journalist, uh, I have to tell you there there are problems within you know. The <laughs> well, if I'm a legitimate publicist, there are big problems. My 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 brother and I were having a conversation online uh, earlier this week, and he was like. To be, it, he, I, I said something and he said, it's because you're the best publicist ever. And I was like, dude, I'm not the best publicist ever. <laughs> I'm not the, the best publicist in Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you, you love me. Um, and, and, and I appreciate that, but it, it, let, like, let's keep it real. <laughs> <laughs> I think it stands to be spoken of, though, that your brother uh, and yourself are really just some of the like it 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 warms my heart because I have a similar relationship with my baby brothers. Uh, they're they're vastly younger than me, uh, six and seven years younger. Um, I'm the okay. oldest of six and everything I do. uh short of you know criminal they think is wonderful uh with varying degrees of joy uh but it, it, it you you two are so much closer in age and closer uh period and well I, we have a sister too so our yeah. sister is my sister is 14 years younger than i am mm -hmm. um she is not punk at all right. <laughs> um but the so not not to inter interrupt what you were saying, but she's been very so she's a doctor, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and 
never got uh, less than an A in her entire life, graduated at the top of her undergraduate class, played Division II soccer. <laughs> She's a friggin' doctor. She works with people with traumatic brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, she's also super hilarious. And I want to add that she and my brother were also both named by Beaver Creek High School as Beaver Achievers. Beaver Achievers. Yes. So there was an award that the Beaver Creek High School gave out. Uh, um, I, I don't know if it was a teacher uh, uh, nominated award or if it was a student nominated award, but mm. my sister is a one-time beaver achiever. My brother is a two-time beaver achiever. <laughs> I am a zero-time beaver achiever. <laughs> and I asked my brother and sister what they did to achieve beaver, uh-huh. and neither of them can remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and then my second question for them was, is it on your LinkedIn profile? And I don't think either of them have it on their LinkedIn profile. And I have absolutely no reason. And like, th- there's no reason why if you are a two time beaver achiever, it shouldn't be on your LinkedIn profile. But certainly if you've achieved beaver one time, I think it deserves, <laughs> deserves a mention on your on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> oh my god. I'm gonna die, I think. Um I think at that rate, uh, I don't I don't know if anyone in my family has been um has achieved beaver status. <laughs> But I I think uh, I I don't even know what to think at that point. We've all been the Tansky family has been, if nothing else, uh, a study in criminality. <laughs> you know what? What are the so my mom's thing was always we don't measure ourselves from the bottom mm-hmm. because Joe and I would often be like. Dude, we've never been in the police blotter. <laughs> and and my mom would be like, but we don't measure ourselves from the bottom. Well, I can, and, I can tell you with a great amount of certainty that almost all of the Tanskis have been in the police blotter. <laughs> we've all been. At this point, I kind of want to be in the police blotter just so... <laughs> Just so there's something to talk about at Thanksgiving uh, as we gather around the <laughs> the uh, framed picture of Skeleton Witch. I mean, uh, we 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 don't have Skeleton Witch in our in our uh, family tree, but we certainly have, you know, going to family functions with the oldest and youngest members of the family high on stimulants in front of grandma (laughs) that's happened um and also for as many failings as we have as as uh children grandchildren uh whatever the familial relationship is my father put it best when we were very young he said you know my kids aren't really quite like a family they're more like a street gang because if you fuck with one of them there's five more of them coming up (laughs) (laughs) and that's the truth and that's the truth that's awesome yeah yeah so i think for tonight sir uh we have figured out a few things about one another most of which is we are both really goofy human beings and yeah and we can't stay on task to talk about this subject very well which no. is fine which is which is fine because you know something i get heavy on this show i get uh you know like what did what did uh what was said about me that i'm like the punk oprah um <laughs> i i i, I, I get, and I can I can tow that line, but in the same token, I can just as easily, you know, 
freewheel with someone and and enjoy company and i think that is the true strength of what i'm doing here and i'm really glad you were here with me tonight because i i think people need to know what the backbone of this really is and the backbone of this really is you and i being two goofy bastards <laughs> and Man, and just we, we, we're just going to be each other's ambassador of quantum and that's yeah, and, we, so. and, that, and that's that is <laughs> <laughs> you remember that yeah <laughs> We are one another's ambassadors of Quan. That is the truth. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go so you can try and shoplift the pootie before you have to get to bed. <laughs> I did not shoplift the pootie. <laughs> I did. I shoplifted the pootie. <laughs> Brother, this was great. I hope we get to do it again soon. All right. All yeah, right, talk to you later, Peter. Thank you so much for having me on, man. Thanks for coming on. All right, talk to Bye. you later. Bye. See ya. Bye. Well, that was it, folks. <laughs> that was Tim and I. Being Tim and I together. If this song sounds a little bit familiar to my listeners, which it damn well should... This is Ship Jumpers by Pilot to Gunner. Well, folks, I don't know what else to tell you about tonight's episode uh, other than the Andrew brothers are a pretty integral part of my life at this point. I love these guys. They are just something special. Uh, we learned a lot about their family dynamic tonight and... Uh, I hope that, you know, warms you to them and warms you to your own family dynamic. I hope that you love your brothers and sisters as much as I do, as much as the Andrew brothers love each other and their extended families. And with that being said, he's been Tim. I've been Peter. You've been beautiful. From 3.33 a.m. Studios, this has been the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye now.